Many of you probably know one of my friends here in the MMA YouTube community by the name of Mixed Molly Whoppery. Well, he made a fantastic video a couple years back called Grand Theft Hype about a certain fighter in the sport. It's a really great concept, and considering over the weekend we basically just saw Bobby Green steal all of Grant Dawson's 20 and 1 hype, well, it made me think of how many other times we've seen this happen in the sport and on an even bigger scale. And let me tell you, there is a legendary history to hype theft in the sport of MMA. And speaking of theft, you wouldn't want somebody to steal your identity, would you? I mean, talk about one of the easiest things to solve, whether you're at a coffee shop, the airport, anywhere around the world, even your own home. The simplest, most straightforward solution to keep people out of your computer, taking your bank account details or anything personal, your privacy, any of that is to get NordVPN. I mean, you know these guys super well. They're really well trusted in the industry for a reason. They're extremely secure and reliable. And of course, if you want to do that whole cheeky thing of logging in in a different country to watch the Office US like, I don't know, sunny England, you can do that. And right now, NordVPN is offering a massive beyond massive discount on their services. And on top of that, you get four free extra months. And then there's also a 30 day money back guarantee. It's an insane deal with all the quality you could possibly ask for in a VPN. So sign up by clicking the link below or just go to nordvpn.com slash MMA on point. A massive thanks to them. Anyhow, I'm Jason from MMA on point. A massive thanks to our hall of famers for supporting this channel. And these are the 10 biggest type stealers in MMA history. Number 10, Lyoto Machida versus Sokaju. I mean, you wanna talk about momentum. Sokaju had done everything to earn it. He took out two of Pride's very best in 2007, first starting with Lil Nog when he was at the top of the division and Ricardo Arona not long after he'd beaten Vanderlei Silva. So could you just smash both of them. On the other hand, Lyoto definitely did have some of his own hype, but to this point, he didn't have much in the way of high profile wins, at least in front of a large audience. He did have a really great performance with Rich Franklin and a very impressive finish. <laughs> But speaking from an American perspective in 2003, this was deep into the dark ages and considering it didn't happen in Pride or the UFC, even predated YouTube, a lot of people just didn't see it. I don't know what you had to do back then to watch fights of LimeWire. No wait, never mind. It's actually just 12 viruses in a trench coat disguised as a saw. And the same goes for the much publicized fight with BJ Penn. Outside of it being a really strange open weight fight, BJ was so much smaller here. It was also before the tough boom. And so a lot of people didn't see that until long after the fact either. And by the time of this fight, Leota did look really good, but he just lacked that big name. So after smartly controlling Sokaju for most of the first round with his trademark elusive striking, taking hold in the second, it was only a matter of time before Lyoto found his big counter and was snatching this super slick arm triangle on the ground. And with that, Lyoto took absolutely everything Sokaju had going for him, and from then on, there wasn't a small fight in Lyoto's future pretty much ever again. Number 9, the Korean Zombie versus Dustin Poirier. So to be clear, Chan Sun Jung had plenty of hype coming out of the the WEC and going into the UFC. Dana White was wearing his t-shirt everywhere and he was definitely well liked, but the truth is, bad decision or not, he did lose that fight on the judges scorecards against Leonard Garcia. And then he got head kick KO'd by George Roop. So by the time he came across Dustin Poirier, although he did avenge the Garcia loss later and even got a super impressive win over recent title challenger Mark Hominick, Dustin Poirier was on just a massive hype train. Why? Well, for one, the documentary Fight was getting a ton of hype from this new upstart from Louisiana with an inspiring story. This is a picture of me right when I started training. I was probably about 200 pounds in that picture. Look way different, man. People like that haven't seen me since I looked like that, like don't even notice me sometimes. Which released at the beginning of 2011. And not long after the release of this, Dustin took a crazy opportunity of fighting Josh Grisby. Grisby was supposed to be fighting Aldo before he had to pull out of the fight last minute, and Poirier completely dominated the guy. Oh, and Dustin had just beaten a young Max Holloway for the first time as well. Tack on a couple more wins, Dustin Poirier was on the verge of a title shot, and all he needed was this one single win to cement it. 
a true star of the future that everybody saw coming. What ensued was an absolutely batshit fight of the two rocking each other back and forth. I mean, seriously, go back and watch this fight right after this video. It's insanely good. It lasts all the way into the fourth when the Korean zombie landed an insane combo and took Poirier's neck with a Darce choke. So basically what the Korean zombie did was took out the UFC's most hype featherweight prospect with his trademark crazy fight style and absolutely all the hype that came with it. Keep in mind, this was way before Connor was in the division. So he got a title shot for his efforts and man, what a talent. Number eight, Thug Rose versus Paige Van Zandt. Now hear me out on this one. I know we're talking about Paige Van Zandt here, but the UFC clearly wanted to push her up the division super fast. For instance, after she won her very first fight over Kaylin Curran, which to her credit was fight of the night, she went straight from the second fight on the prelims directly to the main card. And again in her next fight too on UFC 191's main card, an actual pay-per-view slot three fights into her UFC career. Girl, everyone kind of wants to rush me to the title shot, but I'm only 21 years old. Just turned 21. So what was next? How about a fight night based around her star power? And let's be clear, there was plenty of hype for Rose when she came in on the Ultimate Fighter, but the fact is it wasn't a great performance for her in the finale, and especially considering the way Esparza lost to Joanna, well, Rose's stock had seen much better days. And legitimately, I would not have been surprised at all if Paige would have gotten a title shot if she had beaten Rose here. I mean, can you imagine what Van Zant versus Joanna would have looked like? Anyway, Rose took care of pretty much all of that imagination for us because she stopped that hype train like an e-brake on the interstate because, wow, this fight was complete annihilation from bell to bell. Fair play to Paige as she refused to quit and could have many times, but it was just a bloody mess the whole way through. It was kind of hard to watch. By the time it finally came to a close all the way in the fifth round, it was a mercy killing because this fight was just so one-sided that Rose looked like an absolute destroyer here. And although she would face some more setbacks before getting to the title, she would also steal Michelle Watterson's hype as well before overcoming the odds big time against Joanna Violence. So she definitely stole a lot of hype in her time. Number seven, O'Malley versus Vera. Man, this one just ages better year over year, doesn't it? Although O'Malley has never really accepted the loss. I don't always get carted out, but when I do, I claim I'm fine later. <laughs> He's now the champion, so it's definitely a rematch that people want to see. And I think O'Malley's hype is truly in a rarefied class. If you get the kind of attention he has throughout his career pretty much from day one with Dana White's Contender Series, and while Cheeto Vera was always a great talent, people weren't really paying as much attention back then. Not to mention Vera looks literally nothing like he used to at the beginning of his career. And so as it went, Cheeto pretty much struck gold with the ultra rare peroneal nerve kick that shut down Sean's legs and importantly, the takedown led to the finish. I felt bad for, uh, what's his name? Sean O'Malley, yeah, that's too bad, man. I. And just like that, Vera went from a solid competitor for the hard course to a huge name. And between the way he handled the press going in and after the fight was a treat to watch for Vera as well. That guy, that guy was talking shit while we were getting ready to walk to the cage. If you want to try to get in my head, you got to try harder than that. So I was just like, the only way to make you pay is, is fucking your kid up. They talk about the immigrant mentality and... I, I captured that pretty good because that, that's me right there. That's, that's the meaning of being myself, you know. And he took full advantage with a streak that he started not long after that. He's since suffered a couple losses, but going from pretty much an unknown for most casuals to headlining his own cards is exactly what this list is all about. Let's just see if he can get enough wins for the rematch down the line. If he wins, we, we fucking go. I beat his ass again. Number six, Sonnen versus Marquardt. If you would have asked somebody about Chel Sonnen in early 2009, they probably would have said, yeah, he's good, but aside from that weird Paulo rematch, I don't really know too much about him. That was because back then he didn't really trash talk at all. Yeah, thank God, this is my first press conference. I thought I wasn't gonna get a question. So I was telling my uncle ahead of time, I've never been less confident for a competition uh, than I was tonight. And his early UFC stint wasn't great. He went just one in two before being kicked out of the UFC. And when he finally came back, he immediately got subbed by Damian Maya. 
So while wins over Dan Miller and Yushin Okami certainly deserved recognition, well, Nate Marquardt was by far seen as the better fighter. For one, Nate was as high as a minus 275 favorite before their fight, and for good reason. By this point, he'd basically only lost to Anderson Silva in the UFC. There was a really weird fight that Nate technically lost to Talos Latis, but that was because he had points deducted for carelessly kneeing Latis on the ground. Even then, it was still a split decision. It just felt like a weird off night for Marquardt. And then you fast forward to his one-punch destruction of Damian Maya shortly after that, who had already beaten Chell, Marquardt was easily seen as the top guy in line. So when this fight was booked, no one expected Chell to do what he did. For one, he did start talking trash far more than he did in the past, so that had already hyped up the fight, which was billed as a number one contender fight. The opinion of Anderson Silva does not matter. If, when I get done with Nate and I sink my teeth into that bone, he will get a verbal beating and he'll deserve every bit of it. Disgust him. It's called the truth, and it's very new in MMA. I don't think guys are used to it. Uh, you know, it's, it's similar to guys that train six hours a day, seven days a week, it doesn't happen. And then, of course, what he did to Nate. Nearly every second of that fight, Chael just absolutely overwhelmed Marquardt with an insane pace and tons of activity on the ground to score a seemingly easy-looking win over the undisputed top guy in many people's eyes, at least before that happened. And from here, the hype train took off at insane speeds. He was undoubtedly the top challenger who stole all that praise and momentum slash hype, whatever else you want to attribute to Marquardt. And there he was, challenging Anderson Silva. The guys in the back know who the tough guy is. If, if we walk in the back dressing room and Anderson says put on hip hop and Chael walks in and says put on country, I guarantee it's going to be a hoedown. The guys are going to do what I say. So as far as him being the bully of the playground, well, his 15 minutes of fame is up. Number five, Anthony Johnson versus Alexander Gustafsson. Back in the beginning of 2015, when this fight happened, it's pretty insane the levels of hype Gustafsson had reached. For one, in many people's minds, he just beat the number one pound for pound fighter in John Jones and just got the wrong end of the decision. And while Anthony Johnson was on a hype train of his own, sure, Little Nog even in 2014 wasn't near the levels of hype he had had just a couple years before. He was kind of already seen as an old man. And the PFL stuff was cool too, but after the viral moments of Arlovsky, he kind of gassed out in those later rounds in that fight. Then there was Mike Kyle, which was cool. Gus's popularity was at an all-time high. They even tried to rebook the John Jones fight, but that had fallen through. So this was basically seen as a silver platter highlight reel opportunity in front of his own home crowd. I heard his corner say uh, front push kick, and I'm a kickboxer. I heard it, and I, I know what I do whenever you know somebody does something like that. I know how to counter it. Holy shit. Suddenly that home crowd thing got very depressing as it was aired for American time, which meant it was super early in the morning for Sweden. All those really tired people were just extremely devastated alongside their hometown hero, and Anthony Johnson's stock went straight through the roof. He was booked against Jones immediately following this instead of Gus to further show he had stolen all of that hype and momentum. But then, you know, that whole pesky DUI pregnant lady scandal thing happened. Number four, Nick Diaz versus Robbie Lawler. Wow, have times changed since 2004. Back then, Robbie Lawler was seen as pretty much the golden son of not just the UFC, but the new face of Militic fighting systems, set to follow in the footsteps of Militic himself, Jens Pulver, Hughes, and Tim Sylvia, as the camp was seemingly minting a new champion every year in those days. And with his marketable knockout-laden style, Lawler was on a rocket ship at the time. He was coming off of a loss though, so in many people's minds, he was being given a favorable matchup here. At least you'd think. We all know the story by now. Diaz was known only as a submission specialist. No one knew that he had the boxing style that was coming out of Caesar Gracie's camp. So when the fight began, he not only engaged in the striking, but started styling on Robbie. A bona fide star was born on that night, and Diaz's cult of personality through wind and losses only continued to grow bigger and brighter from that point forward. One fight in the whole world knew, and he took it straight from Lawler, not to mention on the biggest card in American MMA history to that point, with Liddell versus Tito 1 finally happening as the headliner. 
Number three, Vanderlei Silva versus Sakuraba. Sakuraba wasn't just the most popular fighter in Pride, or Japan for that matter. He was seen as the best fighter on the planet. This was back when Pride was destroying the UFC in terms of competitive levels and overall popularity. And he just ran through the UFC's biggest established family. Pride basically took what the Gracies had done in America and hyped it up by adding even more family members. In addition to Hoist, they also brought in firstly Hicks and Gracie, than Hoyler, Henzo, Hyen, even Vitor Belfort. Sakuraba literally beat all those guys with the exception of Hickson because they couldn't get that fight booked. The only other contender seen as a worthy challenger at the time was Frank Shamrock and he had just retired. Then there was Vanderlei Silva. Who? In 2001, I mean, he was fine. He was a good fighter. He was on a three-fight win streak, but he had just lost to Tito in a title fight that was for the vacant belt that Frank Shamrock had left behind. So he was pretty firmly at least in third place there. And he was pretty much just dealt with on the ground for that whole fight. As a submission specialist, this was definitely seen as a shoe in for Sakuraba. Again, the biggest star in the world. Then, this happened. And with that, the Gracie Killer name, all that momentum went straight to Vanderlei Silva, and for the better part of more than half a decade, Vanderlei became the man to beat at 205 pounds. Number two, Rampage versus Liddell. Yeah, so I definitely could have ranked this lower on the list, but I thought this made a lot of sense to put after the Vanderlei entry. So I apologize for cheating, I guess. By 2003, there were two names that people wanted to see in a pride ring or the UFC's octagon more than anybody else. Vanderlei Silva and Chuck Liddell. Those were the two people. Chuck was pretty much being boxed out of the title situation with Tito, and aside from Randy Couture's upset over him, there were no real challengers left in the UFC's light heavyweight division. That and the very much then struggling UFC very much needed credibility on the world stage. When I just walked into the arena right. about 20 minutes ago. I, I couldn't believe it. It's just... It's amazing to see this many people in one place at the same time. And on top of that, Dana White literally bet $250,000 on Liddell to win the Pride 205 pound Grand Prix. So the stakes were set. After a very tough first round against a pre-Uber Overeem, Liddell was looking great. And so was Vanderlei in the tournament. So all that was left was one opponent on each side of the bracket for Chuck and Vandy's dream match to happen. Then comes a fresh-faced rampage. He had absolutely had some great wins to this point, but also lost to Sakuraba in his Pride debut. So he was starting to become more popular, but still relatively new, especially to the world stage. And what ensued was pretty much total domination. After a first round of Rampage controlling the stand-up and getting a couple of really great takedowns, the second became a landslide as Rampage took an exhausted Chuck down, and this time he just battered him to the body and head until his corner actually threw in the towel. I mean, when have you ever seen that in a Chuck Liddell fight? It was a huge coup at the time and completely put Rampage on the map as the new top contender to watch while Pride continued to dominate the UFC in 2003. Real quick, before we get to number one, I do want to hit some honorable mentions. So there are a ton that we definitely considered for this video. For some, I just felt like their star levels weren't as hyped up, or in the case of a big one like Conor versus Diaz, Diaz was already a bigger star for the UFC. And without a doubt, this definitely boosted it. But I'm not sure Diaz stole Conor's hype since Conor's biggest pay-per-views were after this one, including the rematch and of course Habib, the biggest UFC pay-per-view in history. So the hype wasn't stolen so much as it was just kind of disrupted for a bit. But pretty much everything that I put here on this list, I tried to focus on ones where the hype either left them entirely as a result of it being stolen or sent to relegation at the very least. But anyhow, enough of that. Here we are, number one, Masvidal versus Askren. Have we ever mentioned on this channel that 2019 was a pretty good year for Masvidal? Yup! And it definitely deserves to be mentioned here the KO of Darren Till, fresh off of his title challenge with Woodley. But the amount of hype Askren had reached going into UFC 239 was way off the charts. Yes, the Luller fight was a disputed result, but the fact remains, Askren was 19-0. and And similar to Chael, had fantastic trash talk that sent him straight through the roof before he even signed in the UFC. And the war of words with Jorge just kept making this fight bigger and bigger. Listen, I'm the biggest money fight you can get right now. He's going to puff his chest out, yell and scream and act like a madman and probably threaten me of some sort. I don't want any, any 
chances that he's gonna do something stupid before the fight and ruin it. Yeah, he's that dumb. He is that dumb. Plus, there were real divisional stakes here. The winner was going to be in the top five and pretty much earn a title shot or be very close to it. Jorge was a darling of the MMA fan community, sure, but he never really broke through like the Diaz brothers had to this point, while Askren was absolutely stealing the MMA world's attention. Then that bell rang. My god, what a way for an undefeated record to go. MMA is just so crazy. And with that, Masvidal stock went straight into the stratosphere. Then he fought Diaz, which was pretty much the number two guy behind Connor in terms of popularity at that point. And the way he beat Askren, plus all the trash talk, just made this the biggest type theft moment of all time. Good luck matching this one anytime soon. Man, that was a fun list to write. Some of the craziest fights, most drama-filled stories this sport has ever seen. So what do you guys think? Should I have included somebody else? Were some of those honorable mentions deserving a place on this list? Let me know. Speaking of which, you can let me know before I write this list by hopping into our Tuesday writing meetings, and that's a great opportunity to come and help shape these ideas. And you get all kinds of free bonus content for doing so. So click join below or click the link in the description to get all of that. Anyhow, that's it for me, guys. Catch you on the next one. Peace.